Critical Blast. Where pop culture gets blasted. And good evening, everybody. I am RJ Carter, Senior Managing Editor here at CriticalBlast.com in the uh, dimly lit studios of the Critical Blast headquarters now, uh, <laughs> for the time being at least. And uh, tonight we are very, very uh, happy to, th this works out just perfect. It's like I've got a headset on. Can I? Yeah, it, it, it's fine. It, uh, it always hits my head somewhere because I've got this huge dome of grass growing up here that needs mowed. Um, we are very happy tonight to have Carl Kiesel join us. And I can say that because I watched the video where I actually heard him say his name. Uh, because for years, for years, Han Solo took your path down oh. the universe. <laughs> I would say, I was like, I, you know, I read so many names, I just never hear people say them because I'm, I'm a reader most of the time. Uh, yeah, so well, I I know. exactly. Sure, sure. So, so you've got a, um, you've got a Kickstarter, and that is the um, main crux of tonight's uh, discussion. Is this Impossible Jones here? But before I jump into that, there's there's just you know. I've got Carl Kiesel on the line here. I'm going to ask a couple of questions sure. that the typical fanboys wanting to ask. No, um, I'm here. That's what I'm here for. The first and foremost, and, and I guess the most recent of developments, um, how do you feel about seeing Connor Kent returned to the DC universe? Well, I have to say I'm not up on everything that's happening in mainstream comics, uh, but uh, I, I'm always happy to see Connor come back. I'm always happy when, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, I've got a big place for him in my, in my heart. I am very attached to him. I think there's a lot of potential to the character. And uh, it always does my heart good when I see DC feels the same way. So so now there's there's two Superboys running around. There's uh, not, right. not so young Jonathan Kent anymore. And right. uh, I think Jonathan's actually older than Connor now. When you Is he really? Him. Yeah, I can't keep up with it. I mean, I was it was somewhere online. Someone said that Connor uh, was now sh at least showing up in Suicide Squad. I don't know about that. I know he showed up in Young Justice. That's where he was. Yeah, dropped yeah. Out. But uh, apparently, so it was in Skartaris. It was, it was, uh, it was Connor Kent with some of the squad members like breaking out of Arkham or something. And and I don't know if that's a long term thing or just like a one issue thing. Um, but I, I have a big fondness for the Suicide Squad too. So, and I did when I just, when I did Superboy. I I was the first person to put Superboy in Suicide Squad. I, I did a three issue story called Watery Grave with Suicide Squad and, and Superboy. I remember that. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I mean, you, I, I can't really say that you, you got to create Superboy because that's going to cause all kinds of legal issues. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, 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 the lawyers are coming after you. But you did. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you about, and you, I'm sure you've been asked this before because this is, this is the deep comics question where, you know, the comics journal is going to write an article about such a thing. Uh, what was it that drove you to make the decision about Ben Grimm? Uh, when, you know, you wrote the story that, you know, revealed he was Jewish. Well, I, I mean, drove me. Uh, it was really, you know, the the need to get another comic out there. Uh, and Tom Brevoort had uh, talked to me about doing a few standalone issues that they could slot in whenever they needed to, if, if someone fell behind on deadlines or something. But he was really adamant. He said, I don't want them to feel like fill-in issues. I want them to be, you know, issues that really hold up on their own. and um, Jack Kirby had drawn a picture of, Jen, of Ben Grimm in a yarmulke and prayer shawl, shawl, and Tom and I had both seen it. And I said, well, what if we reveal Ben's Jewish? I mean, it, you know, he's obviously not a practicing Jew, you know, not an Orthodox Jew, but there, you know, there's, there's plenty of, uh, you know, lapsed Jews like lapsed Catholics and everyone. And, and it's, you know, I mean, I never, in a million years thought that that was what Stan and Jack had in mind, you know, given the time they created in the character and, and all of that. But I do think it's my opinion, at least that as Jack drew the character, drew Ben over the years and grafted more and more of his own backstory onto Ben, I, I have to feel Jack felt a certain connection to Ben. And so Jack probably never said Ben's Jewish, but I think that feeling was there. That feeling was there because it felt right when we when I when 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 I mentioned it to Tom. Tom was like, "Absolutely, that's what we should do." I mean, it felt right to both of us. And Tom, Tom, and I, you know, we, we have very strong feelings about the Fantastic Four, and we certainly wouldn't do anything just for shock value. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think it was very a, a shock. It's just that um, it, it seemed like throughout comics, even up through today, 
if it's ever revealed that a, a character has um, a faith, and, and we were just talking about this um, a couple of nights ago on a, on a very faith hero oriented stream, uh, they're always Catholic. Uh, you know, it's it's Matt Murdock. He's Catholic um, or, or they're atheists like Mr. Terrific. So it was it was interesting to see, you know, s some differentiation. In right. Because right. there's such a you know, a wide pool of uh, beliefs out there to uh, pull from. And it's just, everyone seems so kind of homogenous um, right. in, in the superhero community. And yeah, every time Ben Grimm opens his mouth or has that cigar in there, Jack just. Yeah, it's Jack's being channeled through that character. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Jack was channeling himself through that character, I guess I would say. All the time. Yeah. And, and, and then the last uh, of the uh, pre-show fanboy questions is, uh, I just, I, it's not even a question. I just wanted to tell you how much I loved Amazing Man and I wish that we could get comics like Amazing Man again uh, because I think they're desperately needed. And is there any chance at all that that, that, that could be a crowdfunded thing? Does that, did that Oh, you know, that's, that's a very interesting idea. Until you said that, that idea never occurred to me. I mean, obviously the people to talk to are Bob Rizakis and Stephen DeStefano. Um, I have no idea what their interest would be. I have no, you know, I mean, like, like I'm low on the totem pole when it comes to Amazing Man. I was, you know, I was their you know, gaffer, their, you know, best boy as far as that goes. They were the creative powerhouse behind that book. Um, so, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I imagine DC still owns the character. Probably. You know, um, I mean, there's been characters that DC has given, you know, to, back to character to creators. Um, I don't know if Amazing Man is one of them, though. So, which is too bad because it was a real special book. I enjoyed working on it. I, I really enjoyed working with with Bob, and uh, you know, I was just getting to know Stephen DeStefano at the time. And quite honestly, he's he's an amazing talent all on his own, no matter what he does. Yeah, and it was uh, it was around that same time. It was like Amazing Man was the uh, this wacky humor book, and then Ambush Bug was showing up. Right, and then, right. And then Ambush Bug became something else. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure. But Ambush Bug, I loved Ambush Bug. He, he was great. I loved Ambush Bug. I did too. I, I know what I was thinking. He started off as a villain. He was he was a teleporting. He killed people. <laughs> he was just. Did he really? See, I don't remember that. But yeah, my mind. Yeah, he he was he he assassinated people uh, in a DC Comics Presents um, book where it was uh, Superman and the Legion of Superheroes, the Adult Legion. Um, really interesting. Interesting. And, and then he started breaking the fourth. He was he was Deadpool before Deadpool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's Keith Giffen for you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ahead of his time. So what we've got tonight now is um, a very interesting character. And I'm going to be honest with you that I know absolutely nothing about Impossible Jones uh, other than that, you know, here she is. And there she goes away because I've got her right on top of your head. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I mean, uh, then I'm going to change that for you. I'm going to make sure you know who she is. Ed Edumacate me. Yeah, educate you. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the, the elevator pitch is very simple. I mean, Possible Jones is a thief and she uh, gets powers and is mistaken for a superhero and decides if people want to think I'm a hero. Why am I to say no? You know? And uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, perks that come with that. Like the cops aren't shooting at her or chasing her. In fact, the cops like her. The cops tell her what they're up to. She can walk into a jewelry store and say, so uh, what sort of security system you got here? And they're happy to show her, you know, and she's not giving up her, her, her criminal ways. She's still, she really enjoys being a thief. She's very good at being a thief. And quite honestly, the powers make it easier to be a thief. And all she has to do is fool enough people that she's actually a hero. And not get caught. Because the idea. if you get caught, it's, you know, the gig is up. Yeah. So, um, so that, I mean, she falls into it backwards, but she's, she uh, thinks fast enough on her feet that she sees the opportunity and she seizes the opportunity. Carpe loot. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I might steal that. So. Yeah, you, you're, you're welcome to it. I, I, I write, I'm a published author as well with the Destroyer series, but I don't get to oh, write I the fun the Destroyer stuff. Series. I, to, I did not realize. Wow. I, I got to write the last three books, so I've been very blessed with that. But uh, my stuff gets to be more smart ass and then killy and not yeah. nearly as much uh, funny and wacky. Um, now, yeah, I mean, the, this is the, the second Kickstarter for Impossible Jones. The first one was for a graphic novel, which 
David Hahn came up with the, the catch line. It was grin and gritty. Yes. And, and that's, that was the name of the first graphic novel, actually grin and gritty. Now did I mean, impossible Jones, did she exist prior to crowdfunding? I mean, was she ever published uh, directly to the stores? Or no, no, she existed up here, but she was never, she never existed in the stores. She uh, made her debut in the first graphic novel. Okay. So how long have you been sitting, how long had you been sitting on uh, Impossible Jones? And b by the way, I just, I love the name because it's like, it, it's, it's like Indiana Jones uh, in a way. It's just right. a there's nickname this, and my real last name. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of Jones characters out there. I mean, uh, Impossible Jones, uh, Indiana Jones, Jughead Jones. John Jones, um, you know, there's there's a lot of different Joneses out there. It's a, it's a very classic name to use. Um, but also, she quite honestly, the Impossible Jones name came out of my love for uh, Al Cap's Little Abner. And he has a character named Stupefying Jones, who's so beautiful she stuns men. with, And she's stupefying. But um, that played very much into how Impossible Jones got her name. And... Uh, I can tell you, you, you ask how long I've sat on the idea. I can almost tell you to the day how long I've sat on it because uh, I was putting it together in my head, putting it together in my head. And um, my wife and I were uh, trying to adopt a child. All right. And I got it in my head for some reason that Impossible Jones's alter identity, her, her real name, should have a, fair, a similar rhythm to the word impossible. I don't know why this was important to me, but it was. Impossible, impossible, impossible. And I came up with Isabel. I thought Isabel would be good. It's got a very similar rhythm to impossible. And then I thought, and then people could call both of them Belle, is what I was thinking. Isabel, impossible. And, and anyways, I had that thought. And really, honestly, like the day that thought hit me, we got the call that we had been chosen for our son because the adoption agency we used, the birth parents could choose who was going to get their, their child. And we went in to meet the birth mother and birth father and her name was Isabel. And I, and I said, I said, I just like created a character. I named Isabel like last night. And I, personally, I took it as a very good sign. Yeah, so, that's, that's, uh, the universe telling you something there. Yeah, and uh, my, uh, my son is about to turn nine. So that was nine years ago when that happened because we got him when he was one day old. Fantastic. I, I just... So, um, so yeah, so I've been sitting on the idea for a while. It's just banging around in my head, wanting to get out, wanting to get out, wanting to get out. And uh, I knew I've known David for 20 years at this point. And um, I knew he was looking for work. And I said, I would love to keep you busy. And uh, we started putting together Impossible Jones. Well, Impossible Jones doesn't exist in a vacuum in her little world here. Uh, there are other, I almost said heroes, but, um, protagonists. <laughs> yeah, there's heroes, there's villains. Yeah. I mean, we've created, uh, I would like to think a nice little uh, world that she lives in. Yeah. So, so you've got impossible Jones who people think is a hero, but she's actually a thief. Um, and then you've got Holly days who used to be a hero. Yes. Decided to chuck all that. Uh, yeah. A known thief now. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's a known and Holly, um, I will say very specifically, I mean, Part of creating Impossible Jones was also that I, you know, I'd written the first Harley Quinn monthly series, and I loved that to pieces. That was such a fun book to work on, and um, I missed writing it. I, I missed, and so I wanted a character that had a similar feel, but I didn't, didn't really want to just do Harley Quinn. But I thought a lot of people would look at Impossible Jones, know my history, and say, "Oh, he's doing Harley Quinn." So I created Holly Days very specifically to be a Harley Quinn type to show that Impossible Jones is different. So when they're together, the Harley and Holly characters are, are quite similar, but it shows just how different Impossible Jones is. And Holly, like Harley, does have a Joker-like character in her background that she used to be the cohort of, the lover of, the sidekick of, uh, and since Holly is a Christmas-themed thief, her Joker is named Krampus. Oh. And Krampus, you know, he's kind of the, the anti-Santa Claus, right? So, sure. um, and this story in particular, this story that's being kickstarted right now, teams up Imp and Holly, and uh, and Krampus is lurking in the shadows. He's, he's he, uh, 
he's he's like overshadowing everything that happens in in the issue. And we learn a lot about the background of Holly, and we learn a lot about the the friendship, and I would say the very strong friendship that is growing between these two women. Now, was was, uh, was her hero identity Holly Days as well, or did she take on the new identity when she became the uh, thief? No. Now, part of my world building with Impossible Jones is she uh, she exists in a, a fictional city called New Hope City, which, um, if, if you want to know, exists in our, our minds where Eureka, California is. All right. So Midway where Don Chin lives. What? Where, where Don Chin lives, who's on I, our show regularly. I, did, I know that. I, I'm not trying to displace him or make him homeless, believe me. Um, but uh, we just like that location. I actually think Eureka is a really nice place. I like that a lot. But um, we, we created a fictional city and we populated it with just a very small handful of heroes. I didn't want like a Marvel universe, a DC universe where there was like 60,000 heroes running around this town. So in New Hope City, you've got Captain Lightning, you've got Polecat, you've got uh, a real weird guy named Even Steven, and uh, you've got a, a female character called Persephone. Now the thing about Persephone is she represents the town very officially, re represents the town. In fact, every year they elect a new Persephone in kind of what a hundred years ago was a beauty pageant, right? But it's evolved into more than that because Persephone actually, you don't just pass on the title, you pass on the powers. So every year there's a new young woman who becomes Persephone for one year. And you know, she does a lot of ribbon cutting and she goes to a lot of hospitals to visit the kids and stuff like that. But if there's a crisis, she's expected to step up. And um, Holly was a Persephone. And, oh. and something went wrong. She actually, as we learn in the book, was forced to step down. And uh, this was basically the slippery slope that led to her being taken under the wing of Krampus and becoming Holly Days. But boy, what a fascinating original concept that you have a power that you're allowed to keep and you have to pass on after a year. That's, I don't think anything has ever done that before. Well, I think Persephone could be a really interesting character uh, to explore. And, and um, you know, there's a lot of interesting corners of the imp impossible universe that I'd like to explore, but that is definitely one. I mean, I know that the current mayor of New Hope City was, uh, was Persephone when she was younger. And she took that opportunity and parlayed it into political power. I mean, this stuff to me is very fascinating. What, you know, what you could do if, if you were given that, you know, it's like what people do when they're Miss America for a year. What do they do afterwards? Uh, some of them take full advantage of that opportunity and and make it into something bigger. And others go on to be a housewife. And there's nothing wrong with that either. And, and you know, she just decides to, you know, continue wearing a costume and go into crime. I think she enjoyed wearing the costume, yeah. And um, at the place where she was at that point, um, I don't think she was feeling really good about herself. And Krampus sweeps in and grabs her. And... Uh, Anyway. You know, it's funny. I never, I never heard of Krampus until uh, Brom. He has one name, Brom. Right. I know uh, Brom. I don't know him, but I know of him. Yeah. You're, you're aware of him, okay? Yes. Uh, he put out that novel, um, and I had already uh, read The Child Thief before that. I was like, oh, I've got to read his next book uh, and see the paintings. I was like, I've never heard of this uh, character before, and then suddenly he just starts popping up everywhere. Yeah. He is, I have to say, you know, it's once you become aware of the idea of Krampus, it seems to, he suddenly seems to be everywhere. And of course, he's a legend that goes back centuries. So he's been around for a long time, but he certainly has fallen out of favor and certainly out of the public eye for many years. And now he's, he's back. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, that seems to happen all the time. Anytime I think I'm going to write something new, it's like, oh, no one's been talking about this for years. And I'll start writing notes and suddenly I become hyper aware of it. And it's just, suddenly yeah. coming at me from all directions, like, well, shoot, everybody's thinking about this. Throw it away and go back to something else. Yeah, I, I know. I've had many experiences like that. The worst one for me was I got very excited about this idea. I had a really great idea, and I was talking to a friend on the phone, and I said, I got this idea, and I outlined it, and he goes, you know, that's exactly what Robert Kirkman, Kirkman is doing with Invincible. And I said, no, no. So that was right out the window. <laughs> Speaking of which, he wears a yellow leotard with a big white eye. It looks like a well, but that was that's not <laughs> that. I have to admit, you know, we had the design for the outfit, and we really could not settle on a color. And 
yellow, I, I'm very happy with the yellow, but red, no, not red, orange, not orange, green, no, green's awful, you know, so we ended up with yellow. And Maybe I, and she I, has a whole wardrobe. What? Maybe she has a whole wardrobe, you know? You can, uh, she's like pretty pretty much, different. Uh, you know, I mean, part of her comic book lineage is Plastic Man, right? Uh, I mean, quite honestly, I will tell you, and I, and I have made no secret of this, that um, I really literally woke up one morning and I'm, I, I like Plastic Man, but I'm not saying, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about him, but I suddenly woke up one morning and I said, oh my God, I know what I would do with Plastic Man. If you, it, you know, Plastic Man, Eel O'Brien, he's a thief, he's on a job, he gets shot, he falls into a vat of acid. When he wakes up, he's got superpowers and he says, I should fight crime. And I said, no, when Eel O'Brien wakes up and he has superpowers, he should say, I'm going to get the sons of bitches who left me behind to die. I'm going to get the rest of the, my gang who left me behind to die. And then he goes after the gang. But from the outside looking in, he's going after criminals. And people start saying, you, you must be a superhero. And he goes, yeah, why not? And I loved, I, I suddenly I said, that's an idea that has real potential. And uh, I, I took Plastic Man and made it into a woman. And I added in some of the attitude of Holly, uh, Harley Quinn and uh, my own personal take on things and it ended up with Impossible Jones. Well, I was going to ask what her power set was, and, and now you've told me. Um, it's, it's very, it's not exactly like Plastic Man. Um, and in fact, at this point in the storyline, uh, Impossible Jones does not know exactly what her powers are either. She thinks of herself as someone who can stretch and shape shift. Um, she can grow arms, extra arms, if she needs to. Um, and uh, she can change her outfit into other clothing, but it has to stay the same colors. So she can create a winter parka, but it's yellow and black and white. Ah, so, okay. So just so like the uh, Plastic Man costume. He always was, you know, red with the yellow and black. Exactly, exactly. And she can become a chair if she wants to, and it's a yellow chair. Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, but sp very specifically, she has complete control over the size and shape of her body. And there are certain differences to that than being just elastic or plastic. I mean, for instance, if we wanted, and she doesn't know this yet, if we wanted, she could probably become a giant. If we wanted, she could probably become one inch tall. She has complete and total control over the size and shape of her body. That's very powerful. Uh, yeah, you could do a lot with that and, and have a lot of fun with it in a world like this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we have a question from the chat. Um, we want to know what exactly imbues the Persephone's with the powers. Is there a magical Eureka scepter or a gem? That's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, there is a gem or uh, uh, that is handed down from uh, Persephone to Persephone. Yes, there's a gem. And um, different Persephones, you know, they kind of design their outfits and there might be a certain similarity, but some of them might use the gem in a crown and some might in a pendant or another in a bracelet. You know, the, the gem moves around on the different Persephones. But yeah, the gem is what's, what gives them their, their abilities, their powers. Do they disappear for six months and then come back for the last six months? <laughs> Very well. I will say, the name Persephone was was chosen for a reason, and it's not just because she's the goddess of spring, but she's also the goddess of fall and winter. Um, so there's 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 a duality to Persephone. Um, she doesn't disappear, but but there's a darker side to her. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I would love to see, you know I, I I've I've got to read it now because I'd love to see the uh, impact that this power has on the. Uh, the lives of the people uh, who who used to be Persephone's, you know, did we could do yeah, we could do a whole, whole a whole ongoing series about just Persephone and the ex Persephone. Yeah, yeah, you know, starts bright, ends dark. You know, spring to winter. Uh, boy, yeah. I'm glad I got rid of that gem before something else, you know, happened or whatever. Maybe that's yeah, why they got exactly. rid of the gem. So, uh, so let's look at the tiers that are on this because um, I think we've got people interested enough now that they want to get in on it. And by the way. Uh, very nicely done day one launch here. Oh, I know. No, I mean, I, I, in my wildest dreams, I never expected uh, even half of this, quite honestly. Um, I, I think I, you're going to make it. <laughs> I, yeah, I'd like to think we are. I don't, you know, I mean, David's drawing the book. I'm inking the book right now. Uh, so, I, um, I, you know, we should finish it about, finish producing the book about the time this Kickstarter ends. And it would be nice to know that we we're going to get paid. <laughs> yeah. It's so, always the, yeah. I I I loved when you uh, when you answered. You know uh, what what when I asked you what drove you to uh, 
to create Impossible Jones or, or the other stuff there. Um, I've actually had <laughs> I've actually had the same question posed to me and had similar answer uh, when, when somebody says, you know, what are you thinking when you're writing this? You know, it's like, oh, yeah, like, you know, when you're in English class and the teacher says, what was the author thinking when he wrote such and such? So I'll tell you what the answer is. And it's always the same answer. It doesn't matter what the book is. He's thinking, God, I hope this sells. I'm hungry. <laughs> well, there is that. Yes. Yes. That, that's always the answer. Um, you had mentioned that everyone sees Impossible Jones as a hero and she's really a thief. Are you going to um, use the uh, tried and true and time tested trope? And that's really hard to say unless you really plot it out in advance in your mouth uh, of Holly Days running into Impossible Jones and says, hero, fight. Or does she know? Oh, no, no, yeah. Yeah, they, I mean, in the graphic novel, the very first scene is Holly and Imp meeting. Uh, Holly has just stolen uh, the MacGuffin necklace. <laughs> so she's just stolen the MacGuffin necklace and Imp shows up to stop her. But the implication at, by the end of the scene was Imp was going to steal it herself, but Holly beat her to it. And so she stops Holly and takes the uh, gem or takes the necklace. And, you know, Holly says, what are you going to do with it now? And, and Imp says, well, I think maybe I'll fence it myself. And they both laugh. Ha, ha, ha. Um, but I mean, at that point, Imp had already asked Holly, you know, what, we should catch drinks sometimes. You know, we should get, and she goes, but I'm a bad guy. You know? <laughs> but uh, so Imp, I mean, Holly does not know the truth about Imp at this point. She okay. thinks she, she's hanging with, uh, you know, bona fide hero that likes her for some reason. Um, there's there's a point in this story because I have written this story where uh, Holly says to Imp, "What kind of hero are you?" <laughs> you know. So so the tears we've got in here, and uh, I'm just going to cross my fingers and hope that one of them is going to be the catch up tear for everybody who comes into an issue too. There is a tear in there for, if you go down, I can see imp one and two PDFs. There's the PDFs for the graphic novel and then this comic. And okay. then there's, see now this is just a comic. It's a 32 page comic, but it's a 28 page story. I've written the whole story. It's 28 pages. Okay. And, and then we'll have a few extra pages of, you know, the character sketches and how we thought up what we did this issue and stuff, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, a little farther down is going to be the comic and the book, and that way you could get everything. Now you, you're going down by some of our alternate covers. There's Jeff Smith, Bone, Mr. Bone was gracious oh. enough to draw an alternate cover should, for us. Should I go down the right side or the left side? I, it doesn't. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, you've got graphics on the let's left go on the side. side. Yeah. So, so anyone who checks the book gets a fight poster or print, I should say. It's a print. If we actually get enough, you know, if we get a few stretch girls, I want to make this print into a full size poster because I think it's a really cool image. Yes, it is. And it looks like it looks like an old fight poster, too. I mean, it's got the um, the aging to it. Right. Uh, right. So everybody gets that. And there's, you know, there's the lowdown on what the concept is. The thief gets powers. And then if you like Harley Quinn, yeah. Superboy, Batman 66, Buffy or characters who have redacted swearing, you'll love Impossible Jones. I, I have to admit, I, I, I struggled with the swearing because the sort of character Imp is, she would swear, but I, I have some small children and I generally write fairly family-friendly stories. I don't write necessarily really um, disturbing stories that the kids will have nightmares about, but I really wanted her to be able to swear. And, and I hate, I hate, I hate when you use, you know, dollar sign, exclamation point, ampersand. I, that always pulls me right out of the story. Yeah, And but I decided on redacting because I thought it was funny. And at, at the same time, my 13-year-old uh, son, when he was seven, he would get angry and he would go, dollar sign, exclamation point, hashtag. That is priceless. That is priceless. I, I so, um, like, and, I, and I will tell you, having an eight-year-old son he was reading the first graphic novel, and when he would get to those redacted words, he would sit there for the longest time, and then he would sit and be like, does this say? And then he would like say the word, and i go, yeah. And he was so proud he had figured it out, you know? <laughs> and, and so I figured it was working pretty well. A hallmark moment. <laughs> yeah. 
So, and then these are some of the interior pages which have been penciled, inked, and lettered. Uh, the opening scene takes place in club cosplay, where people can dress up as their favorite heroes and villains and, and have drinks and hang out. Where, as you can see, Imp meets another another cosplaying Imp, because everyone assumes the real Imp is just a cosplayer at this place. Yeah, what a, what a perfect out in the open place for you know superheroes to hang out. Yeah, um, that's what you're doing. It's sort of like when the Flash wore the Flash costume to a costume party. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Iris gets killed, but you know, that was... uh, so much. Yeah, thanks for bringing that one up. It took the fun out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, in this scene, you can also see, you know, she. Th there's a page that I had to take out because it it ruined too much of the the opening scene. But but they they, they meet up with a guy that in the story is just called the Lunkhead. And he uh, he's not a pleasant person, and, and Imp gets rid of him pretty handily here. And uh, you find out on the next page, if you scroll down a little farther, that um, while she was talking to him, you can see this is a flashback panel. She actually stretched out a third arm and picked his pocket. And so he, he buys the girls a round of drinks. You know, and she, you know, as far as you know, Imp is concerned, he deserved it from the way he was treating them. Yeah, and 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 that. That arm is coming from somewhere because there's her arm. She can create a third arm. She can grow yes. arms. So, so yeah. So uh, he buys the gals a round of drinks, although he doesn't know. And I really love the coloring on this too. I mean, it's, it's got that sort of uh, Batman animated series coloring style to it, uh, where it's yeah, Tony Avina who uh, colored David on one of David's other projects. I think a Batman sixty six project, and when. Uh -oh. David and I said, where are you working on this? I said, who do you want to color it? He goes, Tony Avina. And Tony, he's got this wonderful sense of planes, and he knows how to, in very simple shapes of color, really define the figure's forms. Uh, I'm, I'm very you know, thrilled, quite honestly, thrilled with what Tony brings to the book. And, and here, of course, we get to see Krampus for the first time. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, he knows you've been bad. He knows everyone's been bad. <laughs> He's not, I wouldn't say he's a half, a glass half full sort of guy. So here's, here's where we talk about where the book is. I'm trying to get down to the, to the perks. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. This is, we're going to maybe have a stretch goal with an even Steven Becker. And if you back and the book in the first part, yeah, that's even Steven. Okay. Even Steven, it, it's, it says up, up above his, he, um, he's actually got basically unlimited power. He says here, you know, the man who will exactly match but never exceed the power level of any foe since he deeply obsessively believes that good will always triumph over evil in a fair fight. So as I say, you know, if he goes up against Dr. Doom, he would have exactly the same level of power, power level as Dr. Doom. If he went up against um, Leap frog he would have exactly the same power level as leapfrog he always meets his foe on the exact same power level because he believes good will always win in a fair fight has he ever been beaten well i, I guess not <laughs> i mean, <laughs> I mean I, uh, if he if he has he certainly hasn't told anybody kind of reminds uh, me of uh nemesis kid from the legion i do not know who that character is so I, he's I, a, he's he's a he's a he's a, actually a villain he was a legion reject uh, and his superpower was that he had whatever power was necessary to beat the person who had powers that he was fighting. Oh, well, that's good. I like that. But that, see, that would be cheating for even Steven. He has to be even with you. He can't be more powerful than you. He has to be even. Okay. That's that's an interesting, again, another interesting power well, set. He's a, character, he's a character who's defined by his philosophy, not his powers, really. That's what it comes down to. So he's kind of like Mr. A crossed with the Phantom Stranger. Yes, I was going to say Mr. A, because uh, he definitely has that kind of a, a vibe going with him there. Uh, so so he he has unlimited power. He just chooses not to use it, or does his philosophy limit it like a, like a mental block? Well, I, I do think it's a mental block. I don't think he's capable of being more powerful than the person he's fighting. He will not allow himself on a deep, deep, deep subconscious level. This This is... You, you don't run into characters anymore, Carl, that um, you can't look at and say, oh, yeah, that's exactly like this character or that's this character with a little of this character. These are some original character types that we're running into here. Uh, and, and even Steven has got to be probably the, the most original 
uh, that I've yeah. seen so far. Out of the first book, out of the first book, anytime, I will say anytime someone said, oh, I love Impossible Jones, but I also liked, and it was always even Steven, always. I mean, I have personal fitness. There's two characters in the first book. Polecat and Captain Lightning. I created them in second grade. I have a deep fondness for these characters, but they were not on anyone else's favorite list. Even Steven was always on everyone's favorite list. So uh, if we reach stretch goals, we'll, we will add a backup story with even Steven to this book. Well, we have an early backer bonus here and we're in the first 48 hours. So folks still pay are. attention. This still applies to you. Any, everyone supporting the book uh, in the first 40 hour, hours will get a free uh, vinyl sticker two and a half inches across. I supported Imp2 in the fighting first 48 hours. And that's and what that's you a, get. That's awesome. Now, you going through Sticker Mule? Because that's who we go through all the time. <laughs> I, I actually, I don't know who Sticker Mule is, but I'm going to remember that name. I actually have a very good print shop here in Portland. They do excellent quality work. And I basically throw anything that is not a printed book their way. They do postcards, yeah. they do posters, they do stickers. Always always go local if uh, if you can. I, I, yeah. I will support that idea. But Sticker Mule uh, will also do these uh, acrylic tack pins of things. Oh, nice. Those are nice. Uh, yeah, they are. And I'm getting keychains in the mail uh, sometime this week from them. Because, Carl, the thing is, once you've ordered from them, it's like, you know, okay, I got the thing I needed. Yeah, oh, look, there's an email from them telling me I can get something that I don't, I don't <laughs> need. If I can get it for that, I suddenly need it. Yeah. Uh, like, hey, get, you know, 100 holographic stickers for a stale donut. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but and, now and you're finally down to the graphics for, for the rewards, now that yes. we've gone through all of the hard sell. Okay, so the Imp2 PDF, five bucks. Yeah. Easy, easy, easy money there, guys. Uh, and deal. I know there's, a, a deal. there's a ton of you out there who love getting the, uh, E version of, of comics and you need the e-versions uh, whether you're you know overseas or you're out working in the uh, tundra yeah. we have a guy who comes he works in the tundra he can't take his long white boxes with him he reads uh, yeah. on his device and, and i have to say you know shipping shipping overseas is so prohibitively expensive oh um, that's our other business though you know so a lot of the overseas people go for the pdfs and i and i don't blame them at all i you know i do the same thing if i was in germany or whatever yeah. Um, that, yeah. that, that's our other business. We've, we're, we're working with some crowdfunders in Australia right now. We knock their shipping down to $10 a book uh, into the U.S. Okay. Uh, and uh, we're, since I could do that, I'm like, well, why can't we go the other direction? Uh, and if things pan out, we will be able to ship from here to the U.K. at the very least uh, for about $15 a book. Nice. Uh, which is still expensive, but you've shipped to the UK, so you yeah, know. Yeah, that's it. that's. You know, I mean, I, overseas, I automatically assume it's going to be twenty five bucks or more. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So we're we're trying. We're trying to help. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no, I know. So there's so there's the first book that which is a graphic novel that that is two hundred and fifty some pages of of story and pinups pinups like it, since you have not seen it, I, we have a uh, Howard. Howard Chicken pinup. We have a El Elsa Chartier pinup, Terry Dodson pinup. Um, geez, who else did pinups in there? We have really great people do pinups. Pete Woods. I'm gonna see who else I got in here. Uh, let's see. We have. Let's see where are we? Aaron Lepresti is over. Okay, that's Aaron Lepresti's pinup. That's Tom Grummet's pinup. There's Terry Dodson and Howard Chaikin's pinups. There's Elsa Chartier and uh, Carlo Gian Carlo Bernal, who at this point he's a great artist. Let me see this here. He's a great artist, but he's I know him primarily through Kickstarter comics that he draws. He lives yeah. in the Philippines. He's a great, great artist. That that piece by Elsa had me shivering with Darwin Cook. Yes, I know. It's it's hard to believe that, like, it, it's until about where am I here? Until about six years ago, she'd never drawn comics. Wow. So yeah, she's that's beautiful. She's a great, great person, a phenomenal talent, phenomenal. So, but anyways, and then we have lots of backup stuff, and it's it's two hundred and fifty two pages long, so it's a, it's a big package. And this yeah. comic is just a normal comic. But normal comic. But yeah, it's 28 pages, 28 pages of story. 
Um, do you know what the shipping is on it uh, domestically, at least? Or I it- believe we're going to be able to ship it for about five bucks domestically. The shipping wow. is charged later uh, because this has always been my bugaboo about Kickstarter is you have to sit down and, and estimate how much your shipping is going to be and add that into your goal. And you could be way, way off. If I, if I sat there, you know, I even explained this later on the page. If, okay, maybe I'm going to get 10 people in Canada to buy this. It's a uh, $15 per, per person. So I need to add $150 to what I need to raise to cover that cost of shipping. And then what if I only get one person from Canada? I didn't have to raise all that money. But what if I get a hundred people from Canada? I have not added in enough money to cover the cost of those shipping. Yep. So I have started, I've started using backer kit to, to send out when we send out the survey to uh, collect shipping at that point. And that way, I'm, I'm collecting exactly the amount of shipping I need to get all the books to Canada, all the books to Europe, all the books to America, you know, but I'm, I do I'm think, to, uh, go ahead. I do think we can ship for about like five bucks to get the comic to people in America, in, in the United uh, States. I can, I can tell you that's, that's just about right because I know what uh, our, our charges are with a fee thrown on top of it because, you know, we make money at it. Uh, I'm going to mark with my finger where I'm at on the screen here because the chat has told us that, You've gone up several hundred dollars uh, while we've been here. And you oh. are at fourteen three twenty five now. Three hundred ninety eight backers. Nice, wow. almost four hundred. Almost four hundred. I guesstimated I'd need six hundred backers to hit my hit, hit goal. So I think we're pretty much on on course for that. So very good. Well, I, I couldn't be couldn't be happier. And and backer kit will actually give. They have that nifty little. Uh, will you make it? Will you not? Uh, oh yeah, I've seen that. Yes, yeah. Here's where you're going to cross. Yeah. You're going to cross, and you're going to cross it this week. So, um, I, you know, knock, knock on wood, please, please. So, so, so the difference between the uh, signature series and the um, and the imp to the comic is is five bucks. That's the difference. It's five bucks. Uh, yeah, but it's signature. See, we t- David and I will both sign the signature series. It, it's got a, it. Is it actually a, an alternate cover? We're going to have to have it printed I separately. See that. Where it has a separate white band at the bottom, where David and I will sign. Oh, that so. is very nice. That that that. Uh, so so it's a completely different printing of the cover. I yes, did, it I is. Did not notice that at first. Yeah, that's a unique way of doing it. So you've got that white area perfectly yeah. <laughs> proportioned to oh, sign that, on. That was the plan. That's the plan. You're thinking, uh, and then the Jeff Smith cover is nineteen dollars as well. Yeah, I'm I'm thrilled that Jeff agreed. I I do not know Jeff, but. My kids and I love the Bone books. I've read them out loud to them th- three times. And, you know, we just love Grandma Ben and Lucas and all the characters. And I just cold, you know, cold emailed his people and, and he agreed to do it. So I was thrilled. I was thrilled. Beautiful. Uh, and a Dan Jurgens cover. Now, this is still in pencil stages at this level here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm inking it as we speak. It's about half inked right now. And then we'll get it colored. And so the finished piece will be inked and fully colored. So, but Dan did uh, his usual uh, dynamic uh, version of Impossible Jones. He, he apologized that he was like a little off model, but it, to me, that's part of the fun of seeing these people take reinterpret it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because if, if they all draw it exactly the same way, then there's no, there's no spice to it. Exactly. Yeah. No, Dan. Dan did uh, an amazing job. I could. I could not be happier. See, Heroinberg is in the chat here. Uh, what, I, we could go to him and get a cover of one of his actresses because that's what Heroinberg is. It's a live action uh, superhero series that he does on the web uh, oh. that he runs in parallel with his Heroinberg comic, which is a lot like AC's Fem Force. Right. Uh, I remember Fem Force. You, you could you get a, a heroin. You could get a Impossible Jones cosplay cover. Uh, <laughs> This is what I was trying to take the long way around to saying there. Well, you know, I might have to talk to you about that. I, I've wondered if that's not a bad idea. People, people love it. Um, I would, lo- I would love it. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of times that's how my my decisions are made. Would I love it? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's and and that's one of the things. That's what I do when I have these uh, stream talks, uh, Carl. Is I, I, I'm like, I'm always throwing out these ideas. Like, hey, you know, why don't you do a? And they'll either like, yeah, or, or they'll be like. I'd love to do that. How would I do that? So here's how you do that. You talk to Heroinberg. And if you want a 3D statue print of Impossible Jones, I'll connect you to the right man for that too. Uh, 
That's well, what I yeah, usually. I have about. to say, maybe, maybe for the next, because you know we're hoping to release about four of these floppies over the next year. So every three, maybe four, well, four months probably, because it takes us a little longer. So every four months, maybe release a new one of these. And uh, I would not mind a uh, you know a cosplay photo cover. I think that could be a lot of fun. Okay, Harold Bird, you here? Get get to work. <laughs> Um, you can get all three of the books, not the signature one. Now, this is the uh, the Jeff Smith, uh, the right. Dan Jurgens, and the regular one for forty nine dollars. Yeah. Uh, and I was waiting to see if I was going to scroll down and say, or you can get it with the uh, signature, which I just said you couldn't get. Well, no, but uh, there there are Kickstarter now allows ad, now allows add ons. Yes. So once you like, if you wanted those three books, but you wanted the the signed version instead of the standard version just you click that reward level and as soon as you click it uh because i've done this to make sure i know how it works you click the reward you want it instantly takes you to the add-on page where you can kind of fiddle around and add things on so you get exactly what you want now you could I, I've, I've i've two offers in there you have the signature upgrade which would mean if you got all three of those you could upgrade the standard cover to the signature cover for, for just five bucks, okay? Yeah. Or you could add the signature cover for another 19. So, but there's, yeah, Kickstarter allows add-ons now, which gives, uh, it simplifies the, uh, the number of rewards you have to create, which can get kind of mind-numbing at a point. Yes, I, 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 do, I do like an interview a night with crowd funders, uh, sometimes two a night. And, and I've seen the ones where they're like, you know, I've got, five different products that I can, you know, and I'm like, you know, it's five times four times three times two. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, no, no, let, let me tell you something that you can do to make this easier on all of us. Uh, no, I try, I tried to keep it simple. I, I've had a few people ask, well, you know, like I really wanted the signature and it's only offered on, on this one level. And, and I've tried to make it clear that it is available as an add on, but I, I, I've sent out a few uh, messages to people explaining that to them today. People are figuring it out though now. Um, you've got a sketchbook here. Yeah, the first time around, David did forty-eight sketches for people, and so we're gonna we're collecting the forty-eight sketches into a sketchbook, oh. and it's got you know sketches of Impossible Jones, but uh, also Emma Frost and uh, the Wasp, and uh, you know even some guys, but not surprisingly, mostly women. M many many fans wanted David to draw some nice some some good super gals. Now, uh, I've got Bat to ask Girl. the obvious question on that one. Oh, Batgirl. See, now that's that. I have a collection of Batgirl by accident. Um, it's just Bat every Girl. time I went to a con. Yeah. Every yeah. time I went to a con and had somebody draw her, they said, who do you want? I'm like, oh, Batgirl. That was my first inspiration. And then I just, it was, it's that like that thing where we were talking about, you know, they, uh, with Dan Jurgens putting his own flavor on it. I like to see reinterpretation. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it looks beautiful. But, but now the question I've got to ask is when you publish something like this, uh, and it's it's fan art, obviously. It's you know, it's, well, it's not fan art. He's pro, uh, yeah. and it's characters other than yours. Uh, wh what kind of hurdles do you have to, you know? Well, I mean, I, I was like, behind. first time we've actually going to do it. We will certainly list everyone's copyright. I mean, we've got a GI Joe character, the Baroness, is in it. Yeah. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to credit that to the proper people. Uh, most of them are Marvel and DC, so that, that shouldn't be a problem. We've got some Dark Horse characters. Uh, but, my, but that's my plan, is to give everyone proper legal credit so that it's not like we're trying to uh, infringe on their intellectual intellectual property. Um, okay. And, you know, many people, many artists uh, do little, you know, sketchbooks that they sell at cons, and no one's shutting them down. And sure. this is really the same exact thing. I mean, David is hoping, David and I even, are hoping we will be able one day to sell this sketchbook at conventions, you know? Yeah. It's it's great reuse of uh, of the work that was already done. So, um, but well, yeah, I have to admit, it's it wasn't my idea. It was it was the the backers who I asked at one point. I said, "So, what sort of stuff would you like to see us offer?" And and it was the backers, more than one, who said, "All those sketches that you guys did. Why don't you make a book of those?" And I, it had never occurred to me. So, Genius. give them what they want. Genius. <laughs> The wisdom of the crowds. Um, so here we got the uh, comic and book. Now, what is? Yeah, that's the first. Uh, the book is the graphic novel, the 250 
two page graphic novel and then the comic, which is a normal size. And the book itself is, uh, you can't tell here, but it's it's oversized. This is the same size as the um, Saga hardcovers. So it's about 10% larger than a comic book. Okay, so, I got you. Yeah, because here here is a comic book compared to, so it's about, I, oh, I can it. It's eight so, more. So it's a bit big, a bit larger. And, you know, it just makes everything a little more substantial. You know, comes with, comes with a uh, ribbon, a bookmark, ribbon, bookmark. Oh, that's cool. So nice that, end paper. Hardcover? End paper. Yeah, it's hardcover. Oh, hardcover. That, that, that's a selling point. Uh, we need to uh, not bury that lead here. Uh, you, you can't get a hardcover book anywhere for $39, let alone a hardcover and a comic book. Yeah. So, so yeah. So it's, Dave and I are very proud uh, of that book. I, I, and, it came together on every single level, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Okay. I know which I know which level I'm buying into, and I'm going to upgrade it to the signature one. So. Uh, so and then we so these are already gone, unfortunately. These levels, but they were fun. Where there there are two people I said that I would put their name in the book somewhere. Like this example is from the the graphic novel, and Mike Solo uh, asked, you know, he paid to have his book name in the uh, book, and. I decided to name the beer after him, Solo Beer. And um, every time people drink beer in the Impossible Jones universe, they're going to be drinking Solo Beer. This is going to be around for a while. Okay. So that's very cool. So they got, it, 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 this is beyond just, you know, getting your face drawn into a crowd scene. This is, you know, you've made an impact on the, uh, on the universe. Yeah. I mean, I can't, you know, I, I'm going to name different things. You know, we, we, I have a, you know, a Gonzo burger named after another ba backer. I don't know how often these things are going to come up, but they're in the universe now and they could come up at any time. And then we do offer the chance for people to be drawn in, uh, but those are all gone now. Sketch artists, there's, that's where David does his sketches. This time around, we're limiting it, limiting it to only 20 because like I said, we're hoping in about four months to do the next issue. So sure. we don't want to bog ourselves down with another 48 sketches. Can't, this is not can't tie up this time. Uh, yeah. And you can get the original cover art for a thousand. Is this one already gone too? No, oh, no, that's still around. As far as I know, I, I don't think it's gone. Last time I was available. So, so there are two of them that I'm seeing here: so, the, the ink version and the penciled version. Yeah, because David lives in uh, Montana and I live in Oregon. He pencils them, scans them, sends them to me. I print them as blue line printouts. But as you can see from the scan, I put this really nice top line on my art. Yes. Which, you know, is in color and it labels what it is and it tells who worked on it. And um, so it's it's fancy schmancy. So, and, uh, yeah, but I've done that for decades at this point. I worked on as almost exclusively blue line printouts for decades. Inking the Dan Jurgens cover is the first time in years I've actually inked on someone's pencils. Dan, Dan really prefers people to ink his pencils on the original boards. So I would feel weird doing that because I'd be like, you know, because because if you make a mistake on a blue line printout, you go print another blue line printout out. And, and I have done that. I have done that. And yeah, it is. It is much more frightening, really. There's that stage fright, especially when you haven't done it for a while. That oh, if, if I screw up this this hand, it's gone. You know, the hand is yeah. gone. I, I don't know what where it was before. You know, are, but, are there tricks for correcting things when you're inking, or do you just like you know what well, we're just gonna make it a lot more darker here? <laughs> well, I mean. Sometimes, sometimes those shadows can cover a lot of uh, errors, yeah. yeah. But um, I mean, I, I, I have a few years under my belt and I think Dan before, so I don't think it's gonna be a big problem. But, um, but it is different, it is different because there is, there is sort of a built-in um, security knowing, ah, if I screw it up, I just print it out again, you know? Yeah, so, and here's where you're explaining to uh, everybody, you know, how they can add on in the yeah. back here. I love how you took advantage of, uh, not just you know using the Kickstarter font to you put a text box up here. This is you know, yeah. this, this is yeah. image. <laughs> so it's it, it's yeah. I actually I made graphics for all of the body copy um, just because I thought it had a it gave the whole presentation a, a cohesive look. Yeah, yeah. You don't get that break of the rhythm. Um, so we do have some stretch goals already printed here. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, but we yeah, just to show people where we're going to start. You know. So we're going to get a spot gloss on the book if we hit 21.5 and an even Stevens solo story, which means extra pages or a separate book. No, it would be an extra, it would be extra pages within this, within the same book. So, um, 
So that would be a four page story added to the 28 page story uh, that we already have. Uh, we, we actually, it actually does mean though that we will have to add pages to the book. So yes. we will go from a, a 32 page book, I think up to a 40 page book. I think we have to go up eight pages. Um, and really quite honestly, what that means is there'll be a little more room to add also more of the uh, back matter about, you know, how we put a page together and how we designed Krampus. Quite honestly, David and I have thrown uh, ideas back and forth on Krampus quite a bit. We, we can really show the evolution of that character in those extra pages. So yeah, I mean, if the even Steven story is funded, if we get to that point, it'll actually add eight pages of, of, of pages to the book, eight, eight, add eight more pages. Which, you know, slows things down a little bit more because now you got to draw eight more pages. Yeah, but I think I figured that into the, uh, the schedule. We, we'll still get the book in people's hands by June. We're, we're printing domestically, and really, the printer we're using can, can turn around the book in two weeks. So that's very nice. Yeah, I yeah. just looked over here to see the June twenty twenty one uh, delivery date here. So, so uh, the next question would have to be then: Is, is this you, or is this that late night guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's me. Uh, but uh, but I have had people one ask me that it, it you know I. Uh, I, I would look like Stephen Colbert if, if on one of Stephen Colbert's really bad days, maybe. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm sure no one would confuse us in real life. I, it, that was the luck of the camera right there. Well, it, it, it worked. It was like, did he put a picture of Stephen Colbert up there because there's a resemblance and he's waiting to see if people comment? But um, nevertheless, uh, the June delivery date, does that mean that, uh, that June is also going to be the launch date for the next Impossible Jones? I mean, you want to keep them... Yeah. Well, this, that would be about what it would be, if not June. It, it, there, you know, once again, let's get there before we make any definite plans. But the idea would be that there would be some sort of overlap that as people are getting this book, they would be able to uh, support the next book. I mean, certainly, certainly we will be working on the second book before people get the first book. Yes. You know? But, but you know, make them throw money at you while they're excited about the one they've got in their hands. Like, yeah, exactly. I want the next one. Go out and go out yeah. and fund it. Uh, you're at 14.4, uh, 400 backers. What a time to, uh, we'll, nice. we'll just call nice. quits here. Uh, let you have two minutes to uh, breathe before the top of the hour there. Okay. And, uh, Carl, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, like uh, like Impossible Jones and uh, Holly Day said, you know, this lousy channel secured a live interview with. <laughs> It's been my pleasure. It's been my pleasure. And um, I, I appreciate the, uh, you're going to have to send me the name of that hero thing. Heronberg. We'll, we'll set you up. Hero, Heronberg. I'll get you I, I, I'm going to take you up on that. I'm going to follow up on that. That was a good idea. All right. Well, that, I, I, it's, it's, um, how, 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 did, how did the young girl put it? It's shake and bake. It's and shake I and help. And I help. <laughs> I have a few of those saved. All right. Uh, everyone in the chat, thank you so much for showing up and uh, listening to me go on here. Uh, as always, we don't have a show without you. And come back tomorrow night when, once more, we 